Okay, everybody, I have just about one o'clock. We're gonna go ahead and get started as people start trickling in. And before we get started on today's webinar between the differences uh, between SSI and SSDI, the two main social security programs, I just have a couple of brief announcements. Number one is that you are all in listen only mode, just to cut down on some of the background noise and distractions for the interpreters. Uh, we will have a question and answer period. Once I have a chance to go through the handout, I'm going to ask you all to put your questions in the chat box and I will read them aloud for everybody's benefit. Uh, second announcement is that CRC credits are available for your participation today. If that's something that you require, you can shoot me an email after the training and I will get make, make sure that those get logged in for you. I'll go ahead and put my email address in the chat box. And finally, this presentation is going to be recorded and archived for the benefit of those who were not able to uh, join us today. Uh, it's going to go up on the DARS YouTube channel, and I will send the link out to everyone uh, when I have that up. Just if you want to share it with your colleagues that weren't able to join, or if you want to go back and listen to it again, you can. Okay, so today's webinar is going to be on the differences between the two main Social Security programs, Title II of the Social Security Act, which is Social Security Disability Insurance, or SSDI, and Title 16 of the Social Security Act, which is Supplemental Security Income or SSI. And so what we're gonna do is just take a few minutes to go through the handout that I sent around. And you all should have this uh, because I did send it to the attention of the district managers and I asked them to distribute it for me. Um, but if for some reason you didn't get it, you know, shoot me an email after the training and I'll make sure you get a copy of it. But the reason why I wanted to do this webinar is because other than the criteria for uh, the person having a disability as being the same between both programs, they are vastly different programs in a lot of different ways, as you'll see as we're going through this. And I get a lot of questions a lot of the time between the differences between the two programs. Uh, counselors and work incentive specialist advocates alike sometimes you know, mix up the differences between the two. So I just wanted to, to do this to kind of um, you know, highlight the differences between the two programs and explain how they differ. So let's start on the Title II side of things, the SSDI side. And the Social Security Disability Insurance Program is funded through federal the federal insurance program or the FICA program. So the money for the SSDI checks that a client gets every month comes out of the taxes that are collected as people work, all right? So there's a couple of different criteria for somebody who's looking to establish eligibility for SSDI. And the first one is they have to have a history of work and as a result of that work, paid Social Security taxes over their working career. We'll talk a little bit about how somebody establishes um, eligibility through employment in a couple of minutes. But the first qualification, actually the first two bullets under the, the section that says initial qualifications, these are only two that are the same for both programs, all right? So the first qualification for SSDI is that the client has to meet the medical criteria for benefits and be certified as having a disability through the Social Security Administration, all right? So what that means is that they either have a physical, mental, or cognitive impairment that either is expected to last at least 12 months or end in death, and they cannot be capable of working at or above substantial gainful activity. And these SGA guidelines vary every year. This year, the substantial gainful activity guideline is $13.50 a month for individuals who are not blind. All right. So when somebody first applies for Social Security Disability, the Social Security Administration is going to be looking at two things. Number one, is their disability going to last at least 12 months and end in death? And are they capable of working at or above SGA or not? All right, so that could either mean either they can't work at all 
or maybe they can only work part time and their earnings are not going to be high enough to be considered SGA. So they have to meet those two criteria in order to qualify for SSDI benefits. In addition to the medical and work criteria, they also have to have worked long enough to pay enough into FICA taxes to be eligible for benefits. All right, and the way that they do that is they have to earn what Social Security calls enough quarters of coverage. So the way they do that is by paying Social Security taxes over their working career. All right, so in 2022, a client earns one quarter of coverage for every $1,510 of gross earnings they earn. So a client can earn up to four quarters of coverage per year. And as a general rule, if a client has earned 20 quarters of coverage over the last 10 years that they worked, general rule is that they would earn enough to qualify for SSDI, all right? But the younger that a person is, the less quarters they need. So if you have a client who's maybe transitions age 18 to 21 looking to establish eligibility for benefits, those folks aren't going to need as many quarters as somebody that, that's older might need. Um, but they do have to be insured through that quarter of coverage system. All right. So again, they can earn four quarters a year. This year, they earn one quarter for every uh, 15, 10 that they earn. And again, uh, they generally need 20 quarters within 10 years to be insured. I tell people as a general rule, if you have a client that's worth at least five out of the last 10 years and is paying paying social security taxes, odds are that they've earned enough quarters of coverage. All right. You know, a client might not know if they paid enough into the system, but when they apply for benefits, social security will go ahead and look at the work history and uh, they can determine at that point whether or not the client is sufficiently insured for benefits. All right. So in the initial qualifications box at the bottom, I have a link to the SGA limits. And if you click on that, that just opens up Social Security's website that talks about what substantial gainful activity is. And again, for this year, it's 1350 uh, per month for individuals that are not blind. If you're working with a client who is legally blind, uh, then the SGA figure for them is 2260. Uh, as counselors with DARS, I wouldn't imagine that you would run into clients who are blind very often. Uh, most of those folks are probably served by DBVI, um, but just keep in mind that if you are working with an individual who is blind, they have a different SGA level than somebody who is otherwise disabled, all right? Just to go back to the handout. I um, want to talk a little bit about once a client is approved for benefits, when they can expect to start receiving those, those payments. So if an individual was on SSDI benefits prior to 1997, if their disability onset date is, is before that, then they generally get their SSDI payments on the third of every month. All right. After 1997, uh, the rules that dictate when an SSDI payment is received have changed. And uh, so either clients after that date are gonna get, uh, became disabled after that date are gonna get their payments on either the second, third or fourth Wednesday of the month. And that depends on their birth date. So if you have a client who was born in the beginning of the month, they can expect to receive a uh, payment on the second Wednesday. A client whose birthday is in the middle of the month uh, is going to get their payment on the, on the third Wednesday, or if you have a client whose birth date is later on in the month toward the end of the month, like now, for example, they would get their payment on the fourth Wednesday. So when the client receives those payments just depends on how long ago they were determined disabled and, um, and their, their date of birth, all right? So you're going to have different clients that get SSDI checks at different times based on their, their date of birth. So the monthly benefit amount for an SSDI recipient is going to vary um, based on the amount of money that they contributed to the Social Security tax fund over their working career. All right. So the average is around $1,200 a month per individual. 
But again, that is going to depend on the amount of money that they made when they were working and how much they paid in Social Security taxes. So the general rule is if you have a client who's on SSDI, the more that they work, the higher their earnings were, the more they paid in Social Security taxes, the higher their payment is going to be uh, when they become disabled. I've seen some uh, payments that are even as high as eighteen to $2,000 a month based on a client's earnings. So what they get is going to depend on what they paid in. Right. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, what family members can get uh, later. So I'm not going to go through the second part of that monthly benefit. We'll talk about that in a minute. There is a five-month waiting period from the time that a person first gets notified from Social Security that they're eligible for benefits and the time that their benefits actually start. All right, so it's five months from the date of the disability onset. So the date of the disability onset is the date that's on the letter that the client gets that says, you know, congratulations, we found that you meet the criteria for Social Security benefits, you're disabled as of, let's say, January 1st. All right, so you have a client who was found on January 1st to meet the criteria for SSDI benefits, then their payment is actually going to start in May because of that five month waiting period. All right. If you have a client who has recently applied for benefits, but Social Security finds that based on the medical evidence they revealed that the client might have been eligible for benefits, let's say a year ago. Like so they applied in, um, let's say, January of 2022. And Social Security finds that based on the medical evidence that if they would have applied back in January of 21, they would have been found eligible for Social Security at that point. All right. Social Security can actually pay up to 12 months of rent. And I'm sorry, everybody, it looks like I lost connectivity for a minute. Can everybody hear me now? Can you just type that into the chat box? Can hear you now. Okay, great, thanks. I'm sorry about that. Okay, so we left off talking about the five month waiting period for Social Security and uh, retroactivity. So again, in case anybody missed it when I cut out, there's a five month waiting period from the time of disability onset, which is the date on the letter that Social Security says a client first meets the definition of disability and the time that the benefits actually start. So if you have a client who, let's say, got approved for benefits in January of 2022, their benefits would actually start in May. Uh, and then their first check would be in June because benefits are always paid a month behind. All right. If you have a client who, let's say, was uh, approved in January of 2022, but after Social Security looks at all the medical evidence, they say, well, if you would have applied a year ago, we would have found you eligible at that time based on the documentation you gave us. So sometimes if, if a client is, a, is um, applying for Social Security disability, they can pay them up to 12 months of retroactive benefits on top of the benefits they're getting now. All right. So in terms of medical assistance, as a general rule, uh, Medicare goes along with SSDI entitlement, but a client has a waiting period of 24 months or two years from the date that they first became disabled until the um, Medicare starts. All right, so that's a general rule that pretty much applies to just about everybody that you're working with. Um, there are a couple exceptions to this, and I, I put a link to the Medicare waiting period exception policy, and I'm not going to take the time to go there. You can kind of look at it on your own. But for certain conditions, uh, the 24-month waiting period for Medicare can be waived based on the client's health problems. Um, some current uh, common examples of uh, conditions that could require that to be waived are um, things like if a client has end-stage renal disease, uh, then they could be exempt from that 24-month waiting period, or ALS, uh, Lou Gehrig's disease, because that is a disease that is expected to be somewhat progressive and aggressive. Uh, folks that are diagnosed with ALS could also 
uh, to get Medicare without that 24 month waiting period. All right. So as a general rule, most of the clients are going to serve that 24 month waiting period unless they fall into the select categories of like um, ALS or end stage renal disease. Sometimes you're going to have a, uh, a disabled worker that you're working with who have dependents on their record as well. All right. And if you've been a counselor for a while, you've probably seen this come through. It could either be a spouse. Uh, a spouse that is taking care of their dependent children under the age of 18 full time could also be eligible for some benefits based on that disabled uh, worker's record, whether the spouse worked or not, just based on the fact that they are married to the, the SSDI record holder and they're taking care of their children. Um, and hold on, let me, I got a, a message in the chat box. Um, I think I might have forgot to put the screen share back on when my internet went out. So let me just do that. Thanks for the reminder. Yeah, it was showing up and then I lost connectivity. So let me just do that quickly. Okay, so I turn the screen share back on. You should be able to see it now. Okay, yeah, and I'm getting a message that participants can now see your screen, so that should be working. So we were talking about what types of dependents or family members can also qualify for benefits on the record of an SSDI title holder. So again, if somebody is married and taking care of the record holders, uh, minor children, uh, they could be eligible for some benefits. Um, if the client has a dependent under the age of 18 that's still in high school, uh, those children can be eligible for benefits based on the parent's record uh, until they turn 18, or sometimes the benefits can continue up until age 19 uh, if the client is still in school when they turn 18, all right? So benefits can be paid um, to the child as a dependent of the SSDI worker. And those dependent benefits are paid based on the fact that the child is a minor, not on anything like a disability, all right? Another common form of dependence benefits that you might see are childhood disability benefits or CDBs as Social Security refers to them. Uh, sometimes you might hear it called uh, Disabled Adult Child Benefits or DAC, D-A-C, but it's the same idea. Uh, those benefits are paid to uh, a dependent of the person who receives SSDI, so usually it's a parent who um, also has a disability. So let's say, for example, you're working with Joe Smith and he's receiving SSDI benefits. He has a a uh, child with special needs, let's say the child has cerebral palsy and that disability limits his ability to work. Because Joe is already getting social security disability and because the, the uh, child has a, a disability before the age of 22, that child could potentially apply for and be approved for benefits based on the child's disability on that parent's record. All right, so that's true uh, regardless of whether or not the child has worked themselves. You know, if a, if a, a, a dis disabled adult child is dependent on the record of a parent, they don't need to have their own work history. Uh, they just have to show a disability. All right, so going back up to the section on monthly benefits, that's where it says 50% um, of the parents assess benefits if parents retired. So let's say uh, Joe Smith continues to collect Social Security disability benefits. He um, retires at age 67. Those benefits retire, uh, convert to retirement benefits at that point. His son, as long as his son still has a disability and meets the financial criteria uh, in not earning over SGA, could potentially continue to be eligible up to, for up to half of what his father gets. 
All right. And when you have a client who's getting record benefits based on the record of a parent, it does not reduce the amount of money that the client gets. It's just 50% added on to what the total family benefit is. All right. So uh, benefits on uh, the record of a parent do not reduce the parent's benefits. Um, it just means that the, the um, disabled child is, is eligible for a little bit more. Okay, if you have a client who dies, then if you have a, a disabled adult child who has been getting benefits on the record of a parent, let's say their parent is retired, they've been getting half of those benefits. When the parent dies, that uh, amount that they're entitled to can uh, jump up to 75%. All right, so again, if you have a client who's um, disabled before the age of 22, has a parent who is either disabled, deceased, or retired, that disabled adult child could potentially get up to 75% of the parent's benefits when the parent dies, whether they have a work history or not. Okay, so you may have seen some clients that you're working with come through um, on the BPQI if it says uh, childhood disability benefits, then you know that they're getting the benefits off the record of a parent. Right. Wanted to talk a little bit about, let me just scroll down to the bottom here, the impact of employment on social security disability benefits. And this statement that I'm about to read you is extremely, extremely general. Uh, there are various work incentives that apply that could reduce countable income. When a client on SSDI works, I'm not going to go into the various work incentives today because uh, I'm doing a webinar next month on SSDI work incentives. So this is just how it works very generally. It says a client cannot earn over substantial gainful activity your SGA, which again is $1,350 a month in 2022 for people that are not blind after the nine month trial work period and three month grace period. So very quickly, uh, as you probably know, when somebody's on social security disability insurance and they go back to work for the first time, social security allows the client to earn as much as they want working uh, for nine months without it jeopardizing their benefits. And as long as a person is in that trial work period, it doesn't matter how much they earn, they keep their entire SSDI check. They could gross a million dollars a month for nine months and they would still be eligible, all right? Social Security also allows them a three month grace period. So let's say, for example, uh, somebody uses their ninth trial work period month in September of 2022. Even if they earn more than SGA for the next three months, so October, November, and December, they would still get their full benefit regardless of, of what they earn. So essentially, as a very general rule, a client that's on SSDI can go to work, test their ability to work for 12 months, and in that 12-month period, they can earn as much as they want before their benefits stop. Benefits will generally stop at that point if countable earnings, and that's gross pay, by the way, are more than $1,350, and no work incentives apply, all right? And again, we're going to be talking more about work incentives next month, so I don't want to go too much into those. Okay, last um, couple sections, when, uh, when benefits begin, and it says when an individual can no longer work uh, at SGA due to disability. Uh, we already talked a little bit about that. Uh, one of the requirements for um, eligibility for SSDI is that they cannot perform SGA. Or if you're talking about a dependent that's getting benefits on the record of a parent, uh, like a disabled adult child or CDB, then um, benefits would begin for that child once a client uh, once a uh, a client starts getting benefits based on uh, retirement or disability. All right. So that brings me to another point about uh, SSDI eligibility. If you have a uh, a client who's getting benefits based on the record of a parent. So you have a client who's maybe getting CDB benefits based on the record of a, 
a disabled parent. That entitlement comes from the, uh, the record of the SSDI holder, all right? So if something happens, if you have a client who's on disability, uh, they're getting SSDI and they have a dependent, if your client earns above SGA, or if they have a medical redetermination and social security finds that the client is no longer disabled, if the SSDI record holders entitlement to benefits stop, so does the, the benefits of the dependent too, because that, that benefit is based on the parent's eligibility for SSDI. So if anything happens where the parent SSDI stops, then the eligibility for the, the dependent does too. All right, just keep that in mind. Last section on the SSDI side talks a little bit about how a client can report income when they go back to work. Um, the first link will take you to uh, Social Security Form 821. That's the work activity report. And I'm not gonna take the time to pull it up and go through it because I wanna leave time for questions. But basically what the work activity report is, is it'll ask the client to detail any type of work that they've done since they became disabled. Uh, they'll ask for contact information for the client's employers. Uh, they'll ask for information about uh, what the client earns in the job, you know, how long they've been there, how much they're making an hour, and then they'll ask about any work incentives like subsidy that will apply. Again, we'll talk a little bit more about work incentives next month, but the work activity report is a very general document that just details uh, when the client started working, what type of work they're doing, employer info, social security can follow up with the employer to verify wages if they need to. And they'll ask about how much the client is making per hour and how many hours a week they work, that sort of stuff. So the work activity report could be used to report income. And if, if a client uses the work activity report, I always tell people to um, attach copies of pay stubs with that or gross wage printouts that show what their earnings are, just so Social Security has a good idea of what the, the client has earned in the month. And when somebody's on SSDI, Social Security is only concerned with the amount of money that the client earns through work. So any kind of unearned income that the client has um, that's other than wages, Social Security is not really gonna be concerned about that. Like if they have a pension, for example. Say they worked for, I don't know, the Commonwealth of Virginia and they get a, uh, a pension you know, because they're no longer able to work. You know, that's not gonna impact the SSDI benefits. The only thing that Social Security is looking at when determining whether or not a client is capable of SGA is how much they make as they work. Another way to report income is not on here, but uh, is by certified mail. Um, I always recommend that if clients are going to report their wages via mail to do it certified, because that way Social Security has to sign for the package when they receive it. So what I always tell people is to Make copies of everything you send in, any pay stubs, anything of that nature, um, and send it certified. And then the, uh, the client will get a receipt from Social Security saying they got the package, and then they can use that receipt as proof that they reported um, if it's ever questioned later. Okay, so uh, work activity report is one way to report. Uh, certified mail is another way, keeping copies of any receipts, um, as well as any correspondence that Social Security sends back um, in response to that report is a good idea. They can also report income using a MySSA.gov account. And this is somewhat new in the last probably year or two, um, where a client can create an account online that they can use to uh, enter their wage information. All right, so once a client is approved for a MySSA.gov account, they can use, uh, log in using their username, password, and um, extra security. Uh, what Social Security will do is they'll ask for a phone number. And then every time a client tries to log into their My Social Security account, Social Security will text them an access code that they have to enter just as an added layer of security. Um, to access their account. But what it would do is it would allow clients to um, upload 
wage information data. So um, how many hours a week they're working, how much they're making, and what their gross earnings were for a month can be uploaded online through that mysa.gov account portal. Um, in order to be approved for a client to use that, uh, they have to uh, first ask Social Security to add their employer to Social Security's database of employers if they're not already there. So best way to do an initial wage report is to report earnings initially by certified mail and then follow up with Social Security over the phone and say, hey, I'm working, let's say, ABC Inc. You know, I need my employer added to your database so I can report my wages online. And once that is added to Social Security's database, and then the client can use the portal to upload their wages. Okay. So that is kind of in a nutshell, the SSDI side of things. And I'm gonna go through the SSI side now, and then we'll pause for some questions. So again, Title 16 Supplemental Security Income SSI is vastly different from the SSDI side of things, other than uh, the, the medical criteria. So the only similarity is one of two things. The medical criteria for SSI is the same as SSDI. So again, Social Security is looking at whether or not a client is going to be disabled for at least 12 months and whether or not uh, the um, condition renders them incapable of working Breaking at the FGA up again for you. Is that better? Okay, uh, give me one moment. Let me check my internet connection. I'll be right back. I'm sorry for the technical difficulties. Okay, is that better? Okay. Okay, it looks like I'm connected again. I'm sorry, my internet's been going in and out. Apologies, let me share my screen again. Technology is great when it works and it's a pain when it doesn't. So I apologize. All right, so right before I lost connection again, we were gonna start talking about Title 16 or SSI. And what I was saying was that the only similarity between the two programs is the medical criteria. So when somebody's looking at establishing eligibility for SSI, the medical criteria for those benefits are gonna be the same. So what social security is looking at is whether or not the client is uh, gonna be disabled for at least 12 months. So again, it can't be a situation where a client's let's say fallen and broken their leg and they're gonna be laid up for maybe three months. It has to be a permanent ongoing condition that's gonna last at least 12 months or end in death. And they are gonna look at whether or not a client is working at or above SGA at the time they apply for SSI. So they're looking at whether or not, if a client is working, if their gross wages are more than 1350 at the time they apply for SSI. Now, it's important to note that the only time SGA applies in an SSI case is when a person first applies for SSI benefits, all right? Once Social Security finds that they're medically eligible for SSI, the SGA determination goes right out the window. Social Security no longer looks at that once a client's eligible. So that's the difference between SSI and SSDI. For SSDI, they're going to look at SGA um, on an ongoing basis. For SSI, they only look at it 
once uh, when a client applies. After that, it no longer matters. Another difference between SSI and SSDI is that with SSDI, there's no resource limit. So it doesn't matter how much a person has in the bank. Um, it doesn't matter what kind of property they've got, how much it's worth. Somebody could technically be a millionaire and still qualify for SSDI as long as they have a permanent disability that's going to last at least 12 months. For SSI, it's a little bit different. For SSI, there's a resource test. And the reason why um, there's a resource test is because SSI is considered a benefit based on need. So in other words, in order to qualify for SSI, a client not only has to have a disability, but they have to be poor, right? So at the time so somebody applies for SSI, Social Security is gonna look at things like what kind of property they own. Uh, they're gonna look at bank statements, checking accounts, savings accounts, um, individual development accounts, anything like that. There's a $2,000 resource limit on resources. All right, so for example, if you're working with Joe Smith and he has a disability and he's found medically eligible for SSI, but he has a checking account and it has, let's say $5,000 in it at the time he applies, Social Security is gonna say, oh, sorry, you're over the resource limit for SSI eligibility because your, your checking account balance exceeds $2,000. Okay. The resource limit is $3,000 for a couple. Um, and a couple means uh, two individuals that are both uh, applying for SSI, all right? The joint resources can't be more than $3,000. And there are some uh, exemptions to the resource limit. Um, Social Security doesn't count everything. And when looking at that $2,000 resource limit, they don't count for things like the property that the client's home lives on, or that is on, I mean. Um, as long as the client is living in the home, it doesn't include the value of the home, and it doesn't include one vehicle. Uh, those things are excluded when they're looking at um, resources for SSI eligibility. You know, at initial determination, they're mostly looking at things like checking accounts, savings accounts, et cetera. And they also have to have a limited income. This is another difference between SSDI and SSI. Whereas I told you that with SSDI, something like a pension would not affect the client's payment rate amount. Um, because SSI is based on need and because a client has to have limited income, um, a pension could impact the amount of SSI they get. So uh, Social Security is looking at both what a client earns when they work and any other unearned income when determining how much SSI a client is eligible for. Because really, SSI is, is meant to be used as a way to pay for food and shelter as a last resort. So if a client has another source of income, they're going to say, okay, well, your income might be too high to qualify for any SSI. All right. So for SSI, people have to be really, really, really low income and low resource. Okay. Another difference is that instead of being funded through the FICA taxes like SSDI, uh, SSI is funded by state and a mixture of state and federal government tax revenue, all right? So in some states, uh, the, uh, the state can supplement the amount of money that the client gets from the federal government. Uh, so it's a mixture of, uh, of federal and state money that's used to pay those SSI benefits, right? Another big um, difference is that as we talked about with SSDI, the client has to have an employment history and have paid enough in uh, FICA taxes to be eligible. A client who is looking to establish SSI eligibility benefits doesn't necessarily have to have worked. So even if a client has never worked or maybe they've worked just a little bit and they don't have enough to qualify for SSDI, they could still potentially qualify for an SSI check as long as they are disabled and as long as they meet the um, the resource criteria. And um, so we talked a little bit about what's excluded when they're looking at resources. Um, another thing that doesn't count in terms of resources are resources that are put in something like an achieving a better life experience or ABLE account or a trust. 
those are excluded resources. And I don't want to get too much into ABLE today because, uh, like I said, I do have some webinars coming up on work incentives. And we're going to be talking in depth about ABLE accounts um, when I do the SSI webinar in June on work incentives. So, but just keep in mind that uh, resources that are put into an ABLE account do not count toward that resource limit for these base benefits like SSI, all right? And I'll just tell you really quickly that um, ABLE accounts are open up, open up to anybody who was disabled before the age of 26. And they are allowed to save up to $16,000 a year into an ABLE account that does not count toward that $2,000 resource limit for SSI, all right? So that could be contributions that the client themselves put in, it could be contributions from a family member or friend. Uh, up to $16,000 a year would not count toward that $2,000 resource limit. Those, um, those contributions and something like an ABLE account are excluded under federal law for needs-based programs, so Social Security doesn't count them. And we'll talk more about ABLE accounts uh, again in, in June when we do the SSI Work Incentives webinar, All right? So it's also a difference in terms of when SSI benefits are paid. Um, as I told you before, uh, SSDI payments are gonna be based on the client's date of birth, whereas SSI payments are always paid on the first of the month, generally. And unless it's a weekend or a holiday, then it's, it's typically paid on the Friday before. Another difference is that while the SSDI benefits are based on uh, tax contributions, like I told you before, the more money that a client earned in work and paid in taxes, the higher their benefits are gonna be when they become disabled. Uh, SSI works a lot differently, whereas SSI payments are based on a set rate, all right? Now, this year in uh, 2022, the maximum amount of money that a client gets is gonna be $841, and that's, that's all they're gonna be entitled to. Those payments are set by the federal government and can only be changed through an act of Congress. So right now, 841 is the maximum. And typically, uh, the maximum SSI rate goes up every year. Uh, generally, there's cost of living increase every January 1st, where the, the base rate will go up a little bit. But obviously, you know, 841 is, is not a lot of money. All right. And like I said, that's the maximum amount that a client can get. Uh, if they are working, uh, that's going to reduce the amount of SSI payments they receive. If they have any under income, like maybe social security disability, maybe they're getting both benefits. Uh, that is also going to reduce the amount of money that a client receives. Um, another thing that can reduce the client's federal benefit rate, even if they're not working, is something called in-kind support. Um, and that exists when uh, a family member or a friend that's either living in the household with them, or even if the client's living separately, but let's say their parent is paying the rent or buying their food for them. Social Security considers that a form of under an income because SSI is meant to be used for food and shelter. So let's say you have a client who um, is living in their own apartment but mom and dad are paying for rent and food. Because they're not paying for food and shelter, Social Security is gonna say, well, you don't need the whole 841, you know, the SSI payments are entitled for that purpose and we're gonna reduce your benefit amount. And what happens is they take the 841 at that point and reduce uh, the benefit by one third. All right, so that's why sometimes when you're looking at a BPQI, the client might not be working and it might not show that they're getting the full 841. It could be because they're getting help from a family member or a friend with food and shelter in another way. So if you see a different amount on the BPQI document for SSI entitlement, you know, that could explain why. Let me just scroll down a little bit. So as with the five month waiting period for SSDI, another difference in SSI is that there is no waiting period for um, SSI eligibility. So there is no five month waiting period for that. 
um, the SSI check would start the month, the next full month after a client is, um, is eligible. So if you have a client, let's say was um, determined eligible at the beginning of, July, of um, January of 2022, their first payment would be um, paid in February. And similarly, like I said, SSDI payments are always paid a month behind. It's different with SSI. SSI payments are always paid in the month that they're due. So um, if you have a client who got an SSI check this month, it would be the benefits due to them for April. There is no, uh, no waiting period or no uh, benefits paid a month behind like um, SSDI. But that also means that there's no retroactivity before their filing date. So the earliest a client can get an SSI check is the first full month after their dis, uh, disability determination date. And again, the disability determination date is going to be the date on the letter that the client gets, letting them know that um, they are disabled. So again, if that letter is dated January 1st, SSI payments are going to start in, uh, in February. As with um, SSDI, where a client is entitled to Medicare after 24 months, uh, the SSI recipients are not entitled to Medicare uh, if they're on SSI only, but instead they're entitled to Medicaid through the Virginia Department of uh, Social Services. All right, so if somebody meets all their eligibility criteria for SSI, um, they are automatically eligible for Medicaid but they have to file a separate application for it, all right? In some states called 1634 states, uh, Medicaid is automatic. If somebody's on um, SSI, they're automatically eligible for Medicaid. Unfortunately, Virginia is not one of those states yet. Hopefully that changes in the future, but even though an SSI recipient would meet all the criteria for Medicaid, uh, they still have to file a separate application with the Department of Social Services in order to get that. So if you have a client that you know is on SSI only, or maybe they get SSI or SSDI both, uh, odds are that they do have Medicaid providing that they did file for it. Another difference yet again is that we talked about how uh, family members like spouses and children can be paid on the record of an SSDI record holder. For SSI, it's different. Um, there are no benefits payable to spouses or dependent children or anything like that. So the only folks that are going to be um, entitled to an SSI check are the folks that have actually applied for SSI and found medically eligible and financially eligible too. Right. So no, uh, no benefits payable to dependents there. And again, impact of employment, like I said, um, on the SSDI side, this is how it works very, very generally. Um, but income from employment reduces the benefit amount for $1 for every two that's earned. Um, and I'm not going to go into work incentives that can reduce the amount of countable income because, again, that's a separate webinar. I'm going to be doing um, an SSI webinar in June that talks about work incentives, and we'll, um, we'll be talking a little bit about um, how that works at that point. But I'll just give you a quick example. Social Security is not going to look at every penny that the client earns when determining how much their SSI amount is going to be in, impacted by. Uh, let's say, for example, they're on SSI only, they recently started working, and they come to you with questions about how that work is going to impact their SSI. Let's say they're making, just for the purposes of making the math easy, um, $585 a month. All right. Social Security is automatically going to disregard or not count the first $85 that the client makes while they work, and then they're going to reduce that countable income by half. Okay. So um, what, the, what they would do is they would take the 585, divide by, or uh, 585 minus 85 leaves 500, divide that in half, which leaves 250. And what that means is that out of the $585 that the client earns in their job, only $250 of it is gonna count against their SSI check. 
All right. So Social Security does not count everything the client earns. It's a $1 reduction for every two after that $85 excursion. Okay. Um, if a client has unearned income, it's going to reduce the SSI benefit dollar for dollar, um, less the $20 disregard. So let me give you an example of that one. Let's say you have a client who's on both SSI and SSDI. SSDI is considered a form of under an income for SSI purposes. Let's say, for example, you have a client who's um, on SSDI and um, the SSDI check is $620 a month. The only thing that's going to be taken off of that SSDI check in terms of an exclusion is the first $20 of it. So what that means is if a client is on SSDI, their SSDI check is $620 a month. Social Security is going to take away $600 in SSI benefits to make up the difference, All right? So that's a big difference between SSDI and SSI is that with SSDI, it's only earned income that they're looking at, whereas SSI, they're looking at both earned and unearned income. And again, the reason why they're looking at both for SSI purposes is because SSI benefits are for people that are, you know, for lack of a better word, poor. Um, it's meant to pay for food and shelter um, and as a last resort. So when a client has any form of other income, Social Security is going to count all that income in, in determining whether or not a client is still financially eligible for, for benefits. All right. So as with SSDI, they're only looking at whether a client is medically eligible. For SSI, they're looking at both uh, medically eligible and financial. Right. Uh, section on when benefits begin, I kind of covered this a little bit already, but it's the first full month after the date that the claim was filed. Um, so again, if a, a client files in um, December of 2021, they're found uh, eligible for benefits in January, Benefits begin in February, yeah, pretty simple. Um, again, in terms of reporting income, we talked a little bit on the SSDI side about that work activity report. An SSI recipient could also fill out a work activity report um, that just details you know, when they began working, how much they're making, how many hours a week that they're working, um, the employer contact info, all that stuff would go on the work activity report along with a copy of all the client's pay stubs. And for SSI folks, there's a, um, a wage reporting app that's not available to SSDI folks. Um, but if a client has a smartphone, they can download this wage reporting app from the app store or Google Play if they have like a, a smartphone um, and they can upload their wage information through that app, okay? And I forgot to mention when I talk about the MySSA.gov accounts is regardless of whether a client is reporting income online through MySSA.gov or through a wage mobile reporting app that they're on SSI, um, they will get a receipt once that wage report goes through that they can use as confirmation that they did report their income if it's ever questioned. All right. And again, um, clients do have the option of reporting via certified mail if they're on SSI 2. Again, you know, what they would want to do, um, similar to what I advise SSDI folks, is to make a copy of all their pay stubs, write their social security number on any correspondence that they send in, um, and then mail everything in certified so that they get a receipt uh, back from Social Security, just verifying that they got it. And they can use that receipt as proof of reporting if it's ever questioned. Um, and uh, just another one, another note on reporting is that if uh, somebody's on SSI because they're looking at earnings and because it does impact as a general rule, SSI $1 for every two, SSI folks should report at least every month. And as a general rule, they should report earnings for the 10th of the following month in which they earn them. So for example, if you have a client who uh, recently started working at the beginning of April, um, they should report their income and their work no later than the 10th of May. 
Um, that gives Social Security time to adjust the SSI check accordingly um, for income earned in the previous month, and it helps prevent things like overpayments and that sort of stuff. Uh, if you have a client who's on SSDI um, and they're only earning a very low amount, let's say $600 a month, that, that's way under SGA. So Social Security is going to tell them that they don't need to report, um, but they do need to keep an eye on how much they're earning. And if their earnings change above that SGA, that above that 1350, then they would have to start reporting at that point. Um, so how often a person reports is gonna depend on how much they're making, number one, and number two, what type of benefits they're getting. Um, if they're on SSI only, or if they're a concurrent beneficiary, you wanna make sure that they're reporting at least every month, um, especially even if they're salary, they should still report. Um, and especially if income changes, you know, if, if income goes up or down in a month, Social Security needs to know that so the payment can be um, adjusted accordingly. All right. Last uh, note on here that I wanted to review before we open it up for questions is it says best to work with a WISA, working center specialist advocate. I'm sure that a lot of you, especially if you've been around for a long time, are very familiar with our WISA partners around the state. Uh, that you can work with to help people access things like work incentives or to do a work in, uh, a work world summary and analysis report for somebody that would kind of go through um, how work is going to impact their benefits, uh, how it's going to impact their disposable income, and work world also screens for work incentives that the client might be eligible for and not using yet. Right. So, the idea of this webinar was just to kind of give you the basics on the differences between the two programs. By no means are you expected to be an expert or expected to be able to answer you know, in-depth questions. That's why we have a network of WISAs who have been trained in um, you know, benefits and work incentives, trained in how Social Security looks at income for the two programs. They can advise people on you know, how work is going to impact those benefits. They can screen for work incentives, uh, help the client put those work incentives into place. Um, so those are all kinds of billable services um, that, that you guys as counselors can send to a WISA to help a client um, access. And we'll talk more about the types of different billable services available under the WISA programs in the next couple webinars. On May 25th, I'm going to be doing one same time, 1 to 2.30, on the different SSDI work incentives. And then on June 22nd, from 1 to 2.30, I'm going to be doing one on SSI work incentives. And I hope um, that you'll be able to join. I'm going to dive a little bit deeper into the different work incentives that are available to folks, how they can be used to reduce countable income when a client is working and on benefits and um, how you can uh, use WISAs to help the client access some of these services. And that's all I had on the handout. And before I open it up for questions, I just wanna put my email address in the chat box. So if you need, if you need a copy of the handout or if you need CRC credits, I'll put my email in the chat box for you. Just email me and um, I'll make sure the CRCs get logged in for you and I'll give you a copy of the handout if you need one. Um, and that's about it that I had. I wanted to leave about a half hour for questions. Um, so if you have any burning issues um, that you're wondering about, you can put them in the chat box and I'll read them aloud. Uh, Heather, Heather Carroll says, no questions for me, but thank you so much for the chart. It's very helpful. Looking forward to the work and Simmons webinar. Sounds very helpful as well. Yeah, you're wel welcome, Heather. I'm glad that you found the, the chart helpful. I was thinking about maybe doing a PowerPoint, but then I thought, you know, doing a side-by-side -side chart on a one page would probably be more helpful for folks just as a quick reference or maybe something they can hand out to a client if there's general questions. Um, I thought a handout would be a little bit easier than having to go through a whole PowerPoint. So I'm glad that that worked for you. It's just a, a good, you know, reference tool to keep handy. Um, that you can access at any time if, um, 
if a client has general questions and Richard says, I really like this chart versus the PowerPoint. Okay, good, I'm, I'm glad that this worked out well. Heather says, what are the dates again for the future webinars? Uh, the SSDI webinar is on May 25th from 1 to 2.30. And the SSI webinar, Working Center's webinar is June 22nd from 1 to 2.30. Heather just says, thank you, you're welcome. I'll give folks another few minutes to type out any questions that they've got. And again, I apologize for the, the technical difficulties with the internet going down. I hope we were able to get all the information. And if we don't get to your question today, um, you can call me or email me anytime. You know, a big part of my job is to um, provide technical assistance to VR counselors like yourselves whenever there are issues related to benefits or work incidents that come up. So if you have a question that I didn't get to, you know, call or email me, or if there's something that you missed, if you came in late, or if you missed something because the internet went down, you can uh, call and email me anytime. I'm glad to, to work with you on any questions you have. I'll give folks uh, a few more minutes to type out any questions they have or comments. If there is none, I can let you go a little early. I did have this scheduled at 2.30 only because I never know how many questions there are going to be. Um, but if, um, if nobody has um, any further questions, uh, we can end early for today. And um, again, uh, I will send out a link to all the district managers when the archive of the webinar is available. Um, that'll go up on the DARS YouTube channel. And um, you can go back and listen to this you know, at your convenience as you want to. And again, uh, don't forget if it needs CRCs, you can email me and I can get those into place for you. All right. I wanna thank you all for your time, attendance and participation today. I wanna thank our interpreters and our captioner for being here. Appreciate your time. And uh, thank you very much, everybody. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye. Mike? Yes. All righty, you still have the recording running, so I'm not gonna show my face. Okay, I think I just turned it off. I think. It's, it's still recording. Okay, um, let me stop.